Thank you guys for joining. As I mentioned a second ago, we're still on point one, which is presentation of the preliminaries, the basis. So it's like the foundation of a house. Last week, we covered point one and point two. This week, we're going to get into point three, which gets pretty crazy. Karma is, it's cause and effect, but it, you can get pretty deep when you start digging into karma. So, by the way, I forgot to say this. Always try whenever you guys can. Try to take a second. In fact, let's take, we'll take one to two minutes of silence right now. Just develop the pure wish, which is that as we practice Dharma today together, develop the wish in your heart that, that by practicing Dharma, we will benefit all sentient beings. That's a pure wish, a wish rooted in love. So just, let's just be silent for a moment and cultivate that wish that by practicing Dharma today, we will benefit all sentient beings. It's called pure motivation. Wonderful. So whenever possible, if we can develop the pure intention in life, it can really make every act that we do more meaningful and more positive. Okay. So just to recap what we covered last week, practice human birth, it's really difficult to be born as a human. So the idea of contemplating precious, the precious human birth is you can get really expansive into that single topic, but the simplified version is be grateful that we've been born as, as humans because we have human intelligence, which means that we have the ability to, to change. We, we are capable of great transformation. So, you know, be grateful that we have this opportunity. And the fact that we all found Dharma, which is one of the most powerful ways to transform our minds and our hearts is really a big deal. So that's the precious human rebirth, the very summarized version. And then impermanence and death, nothing lasts. Literally everything around us, everything in our life is slowly dissolving, dissolving. It's kind of like it's expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting. That's how reality is. It doesn't seem that way. When we look around, we think of everything as solid and concrete, but that's not reality. Everything is not solid and concrete. Everything is, you know, arising, persisting and disbanding. That's just reality. So if we can contemplate that and then accept it. It will lead us to peace because when the, when the good stuff comes up, we won't get so addicted to it, you know? And then when the bad stuff comes up, we won't be so, you know, like averse to it. So ferociously opposed to what we think we don't like. So that's kind of the, the overview of impermanence and death. Any questions about what we covered last week? Any thoughts, comments, or questions that came up for any of you? No? Okay, cool. One of the most important things I want to mention here, and it's just really good for all of us to think about when, especially when you're new, you come into to Buddhism and it's like this, it's so foreign for us as Americans. And you look at these teachings and there's a big risk of these teachings just sitting on the page. And I really want everybody to make sure that you don't let that happen because these teachings are like the most precious diamonds being given to us that they can, the teachings can change our lives. They can give us peace. They can free us from all of our habitual habit patterns, mental and, and, you know, mental and emotional habit patterns. So the key is continuously asking, how does this reply to, or how does this relate to my life? How do I apply it to my life? Again and again, we really should ask that question because if you don't ask that question, the chances of this stuff getting into your heart and mind are slim to none. So after these teachings, we should always listen, reflect, meditate, or you could say read, reflect, meditate. So I just want to mention this is so important because, you know, learning about, you know, karma and, and, and impermanence and a precious human rebirth, you're not learning it just so you can be a know-it-all. It's not really, that's not the, that's not the, the objective. The end objective is peace. The Buddha and all of the masters gave us these teachings because they want to they wanna help us to stop, stop engaging in thought, speech, and action that harm us and harm others. So I just want to make sure this is a really important point. Anytime you 
listen to Dharma. Don't think of it as some esoteric, far Eastern thing that you don't get because it applies to all of us if we take it and apply it. This week, we're getting into karma. So what is karma? Most of you have, almost everybody on this class has probably heard of karma in one way or another. Some of you have studied it pretty in, in, in some level of depth. Some of you, it's a little bit of a new topic. Essentially, everything we think, say, and do plants a seed. And that seed will eventually blossom. So it's like you plant an acorn. I have the imagery on the screen here. You plant an acorn, it is going to grow into a tree. It's only a matter of time now. It, it's probably not going to just sprout up as a giant tree immediately, right? It's going to take a little bit of time, but it's, it's unequivocal <clears throat> that if you plant an acorn, it is going to grow into a tree. And by the way, it's not going to grow into a pear tree. It's not going to grow into a peach tree. It's not going to become a car. It's not going to become a human. It's going to become an acorn. Uh, now, if you want to plant a peach tree or if you want to plant a, an apple tree or a pear tree, you need to plant the correct seed. So everything we think, say, and do will become a seed that will grow. Now, when you first hear this, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I will give you guys some examples today. And my goal is to make it as, as simple and applicable as possible so that it doesn't kind of stay on the shelf of your mind, but rather it can, it can slowly seep into your heart and it can be something that guides the way you live. Absolutely nothing is causeless. Okay. So this is really important. Sometimes people, we might look around the world and think, oh, you know, that guy's a billionaire businessman. He is just, you know, he's just born that way. He was born rich or, you know, Michael Jordan was just a natural athlete. Did anybody know Jordan was cut from his freshman high school basketball team? Anybody ever heard that story? Pretty amazing. So that's kind of surprising, right? When you, when you think about Michael Jordan, because he's such a household name, at least for those of us who were, you know, around when he was playing, isn't that a little bit surprising that he was cut from his high school basketball team? The point is, nothing is causeless. He, nobody's just born. Oh, that guy was just born an athlete. Sure, don't get me wrong. Jordan is 6'6". Six, six. I'm 5'8". So it's a little harder for Jason to dunk a basketball or for most of us on this call to dunk a basketball. When you're 6'6", six six, you do have absolutely he has physical advantages over a guy who's short. Having said that, he was cut from his freshman basketball team. So what is it that made him great? It was he kept planting the seeds. He took thought, speech, and action again and again, again and again, moment after moment, day after day. He engaged in thought, speech, and action that, that grew and flourished into the seed of him being an amazing athlete, right? So if all of us on this call, I'm, I'm just going to make an assumption, all of us on this call want happiness. We want peace. We want happiness. We want to live a good life. So if we want happiness, then we have to create the causes for happiness. And that's what karma is. Karma is about creating the causes for happiness and stopping the causes for suffering. Okay. Just like Michael Jordan can become a world-class athlete by, by engaging in thought, speech, and action that makes him a great athlete. We can become incredibly peaceful, loving, harmonious, happy people by engaging in things that create that, okay? And of course, that's what Lojong is about. It's about giving us the tools and the know-how and the knowledge and the wisdom to do those things, right? So guess, this is Geshe La, our teacher. Most of you know Geshe La. So maybe some of you are newer and you've never met him. Once we finally get past COVID, we will reopen the center and we will welcomely or, you know, lovingly welcome all of you back. But anyway, this is Geshe La. He's our authentic teacher. He's an amazing person. And one of the things he always talks about is the importance of watching the mind. Again and again, we have to watch our mind because karma can be, can, you can plant karmic seeds in your mind immediately. Just by thinking thoughts, all of a sudden you're planting these seeds. So Geshe La says, with the mind, all of these things can be done really quickly. He's talking about karma. Our mental thoughts is where we really have to be careful because the karmas can be collected so quickly. 
So, you know, when it comes to going out and taking action, it's a little slower than a fractional thought that, is, that, that, that pops up in your mind within a fraction of a second. That can, you can plant a seed in, in literally in a millisecond by thinking, whereas taking action, it just takes more effort and it's slower, right? So all the masters will agree that, in, in Buddhism, will agree that the mind is principle, meaning the mind is what, what guides our motivation. In Buddhism, motivation is everything. Motivation what really matters is so if we have a strong motivation for love and compassion and, and to benefit other beings, it can completely transform certain actions, right? So that's really what the Dharma is about, is about creating the motivation and the, and the proper intention. That's why we, when we started the class, I said, take a moment and create pure motivation. You know, let this action that I'm engaging in benefit all living beings okay so whether we are good-hearted coming from a negative place it depends on if there's self-clinging and self-interest such as what did i get out of this so doing it for the right reason this is a bad intention so if you're if you're going around and doing things with the with the mind of me 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 i want to get something out of this that is literally what will create negative karma so it's self-clinging and selfishness, as you guys will see today during the class. Selfishness is, is the, sort of the, the seed for creating negative karma. So when we engage in thought, speech, and action with the, with the thought of me, 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 that is what causes our own suffering and the suffering of others, right? So I'll give you guys some good examples as we kind of get into this. Any questions? Let's say you have a friend or a family member or a coworker, and that person is doing something very harmful, right? Maybe it's a kid. Some of you have probably had children. Or if, it, if you haven't had children, I, I'm not a parent, you, you kind of understand what kids are about, right? So let's say you have a kid and they're engaging in a negative behavior. It could be they're bullying their brother and sister, or maybe they're I don't know, they're, they're, they're addicted to video games and they stay up all night long doing it. A parent is going to go to them and say, you're sternly, they're going to go to them and sternly say, you've got to stop it, right? Now, the kid might perceive that as something that's like, oh man, dad's being really mean. But that act is done completely out of love and compassion, right? Okay. So it appears, it appears one way, but the Buddhist perspective is that that, that that the intention, the intention of the father is to protect his son from being a video game addict or from bullying his brother and sister. And the example you just gave of like disciplining a child when they're misbehaving from a compassionate standpoint, from the eyes of compassion, and you're trying to do something genuinely to correct their behavior versus screaming at someone out of anger in that situation with a very different motivation. You're just losing control of yourself and lashing out at the child. That's, those are two very different things. And we act and we, we, we let the action unfold in a very different way, depending on where it's coming from. Absolutely. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very good conversation. And, and, and again, the, the Buddhist perspective is, you know, we we absolutely don't believe in harming anybody, right? I mean, we're the whole purpose of of the Dharma and 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 Lojong and Buddhism is love and compassion. So, never ever would we sort of endorse or or accept killing. The motivation that we have, and a, a better example is the father or the mother disciplining their kid, or maybe you have, you know, some of you have had as of I have had alcoholic family members, you know, and, and you're not going to, you know, if you see that person destroying themselves, you're not going to smile and say, hi, how are you? Please let me buy you some more alcohol. Of course not. Right now. And you might take a fierce, your facial expression might not be happy with them. And you might be, you know, the whole idea of tough love, but you're doing it because you want to try to stop them from harming themselves. Whereas 
you know, if you look at somebody from the outside looking in, you might think, well, gosh, that person's not very nice, but the motivation is to protect them, right? So, yes. yeah, great, great conversation. Now, what is karma? It's, I really like this, this definition from Jigden Sumgon, who is the founder of the Drikung Kagyu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. He said, karma cause and effect is the natural expression of moment to moment thoughts. And thinking back to what Gestela said is, is it's so important to watch the mind because we have these moment to moment thoughts and the moment to moment thoughts will manifest as all myriad of different things. So if you're sitting around thinking about certain things, there's a very good likelihood that those, those thoughts are going to turn into action. Right. So it's very, very important to transform our thinking. And that's, that's what Lojong is. It's thought transformation, right? We're trying to transform our selfish, the, 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 the common mode of our thinking is selfish. It's what can I get? What can I do? What can I enjoy? How can I avoid pain and pain and suffering? How can I get more pleasure? And that's just what we do all day, every day. It's what we do. So the, the goal is how do we change that? Okay. So now, does this evoke any sort of feeling in anyone? This slide? I can't be the only one. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody love Doritos as much as me? No, I have an aversion. <laughs> well, that's good. If you have an aversion to Doritos, you're winning all day long. <laughs> you are winning. But this is an example. Now, if you don't, if you don't love Doritos, insert whatever it is that you like. It could be cheesecake. It could be donuts. It could be chocolate. It could be Coca-Cola. Pick something that's not particularly healthy for you, right? And insert it in the slide, okay? This is where we can start to apply karma to our own lives. And by the way, it doesn't have to be something that you eat because any thought, speech, or action plants a karmic seed that will manifest later. This could just as easily be Netflix because most of us, especially during the pandemic, watch a ton of TV. It could be, it could be reading fiction. You're, hey, I'm really into these fiction books. That's just like a probably more distinguished way of entertaining yourself versus Netflix. It's probably a lot better for you. But the point is, pick an activity. I really like the idea of Doritos or Coca-Cola because these things are pretty, studies show these things can be pretty harmful, okay? So now let's look at karma. What, how is karma created? Okay, first of all, just to be clear, karma is any thought, speech, or action that we participate in. When we think a thought, when we speak a word, when we take an action, it is going to create karma, okay? So how does it work? Let's, let's, let's dig into this. First of all, you take a bite of the Dorito, that's called contact. Your con your the the tenth object, which is the Dorito, and your taste buds, they have contact, they come together. So you taste the chip, and then that creates a feeling. Everything that we experience in our lives, any sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensation, or thought, okay, any one of those six sense bases, when we when we contact an item, when we contact a sight, sound, smell, taste, or a tactile sensation, it creates a feeling. Now, a feeling is not like an emotion, like oh, I'm feeling angry at Johnny. That's not a feeling. In Bo that's a feeling as normal American vernacular. In Buddhism, a feeling is anything that is categorized as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, right? So when, when Jason tastes the Dorito, Instantly, there's a pleasant feeling. By the way, I haven't eaten Doritos for years. But if I were to start eating them, I think it would probably create an avalanche of habitual activity because they do taste good to me. So you contact the item, you eat the Dorito, or you drink the Coca-Cola, or for some people, you drink the beer, or for some people, you consume the Netflix or you engage in an act that creates a really pleasant feeling, okay? Now, oh, by the way, another example for me, somebody cooking really 
strong smelling food. I have very sensitive, my nose is very sensitive. You could take, you could cut a tiny piece of onion and put it somewhere in a big house and I would somehow smell it. So when somebody cooks something that I consider to be overwhelming to my senses, there's the smell and then a feeling. And in that case, it would be an unpleasant feeling. So most of us have been to, any of you guys ever been to like a, a basketball game or a concert and you go in to use the restroom and you're like, whoa, that is not good. <laughs> the smell in the, in the public restrooms. So that's another example of how you can, you can create karmas by experiencing something that you're really averse to. So, so far we're, we're taking a bite of the chip. Instantly, there's a pleasant feeling. Then this creates something called craving. And really the simple way to explain this is more, 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 right? Your mind starts to light up and they call this dopamine, right? The scientists say like you, the dopamine centers in your brain start expanding and, and then you want to eat the whole bag, okay? And then, so craving is kind of like a general sense of attachment to something. Grasping is just a much more intense form of craving. So once you take a bite of the chip, the pleasant feeling arises, you start wanting more and more, and then it creates this grasping. So in, in, in the psychological world, I think the psychologists are going to tell you that you're creating something and you're putting it in your subconscious, right? You're creating this thing, you're putting it in your subconscious, and then it's creating a memory. You might just call this a memory. You could say one of the foundational aspects of karma is the memory, right? You engage in something and then you remember it. You remember that those Doritos were good, right? And by the way, again, substitute your thing. It may not be Doritos. It may be chocolate. It may be, I mean, most of us are addicted to everything to, on some level, right? Because we're not, a, we're not enlightened beings. So we're addicted to praise. Anybody here love being criticized? I just love being told that I'm fat. I just like it. Makes me feel no. Did anybody ever walk up and say, You're you gain it looks like you gained ten or fifteen pounds. If you hang around Asians, Asian people are they have a different way of communicating than Americans. Asians are like, Hey, I'm chubby. And they laugh about it. Guess who uh, calls himself a chubby monk? He's like the chubby monk. He's not so chubby anymore. He lost some weight. But in America we're really sensitive about our weight, aren't we? You, you want to make an enemy? Go up to somebody and say, hey, man, looking good. I see you've been eating. I see you've been eating. You haven't been missing many meals. You, what, what's that person going to say, right? So the bottom line is we, karma is about we, we want pleasant things that we like, right? And we don't want those things that we're, that we're averse to. And we don't understand that we run around in our lives like mad men and mad women, chasing the things we want, pushing away the things we don't want, and that makes us miserable. We, th we think it's going to make us happy, but it actually, in reality, it makes us miserable. Why does it make us miserable? Because we become enslaved, we become imprisoned to these driving forces of desire and aversion. And it's based on ignorance. So the three poisons are desire, aversion, and ignorance. Ignorance is like, is like the, the instigator. You know, he's like the one that's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make this guy hooked on the Doritos. So ignorance is the one that makes it so that you can't see that these things are really harmful. So the, does this general understanding of karma make sense for everybody? Does it make for for the new people who have never maybe studied karma? Does it does it make more sense than just like that? Oh, what goes around comes around. What goes around comes around is like, hey, if I'm nice to you know, if I'm nice to Susie, she's going to be nice to me. That does play into karma, by the way. But karma is not that simple. It's anything you think, say, or do plants a seed that will come to fruition. All right. So the minute you eat that Dorito. The minute you eat that Dorito, a pleasant feeling arises, right? I like it, right? I like the Dorito. And then you crave it, and then you grasp it. And then guess what? 
then all of a sudden you eat Doritos the next day. Okay. So then you're doing two things. Karma is ripening from yesterday. Because see, karma doesn't, you don't just plant a seed. It also, it also, the, the walnut tree also grows, right? So then I'm eating the bag of Doritos the second day. I ate the first bag Monday. And then Tuesday rolls around and there's a great new movie on Apple TV. If you're a TV addict like Jason, I watch too much TV, I'll tell on myself. So then I'm watching my, my movie the next day. And it's like, well, you got to have that bag of Doritos with your movie, right? Or vegan cheese puffs if you're like me. So what happens is day two, you're eating the Doritos and that's doing two things. Number one, the karma from yesterday is arising. That walnut tree that you planted yesterday is arising, right? Because you're, you're wanting those Doritos. That is a result of tasting them yesterday and letting yourself become compulsively addicted to the Doritos. So then day two, you're eating the Doritos again. So the karma is manifesting from yesterday, but guess what it's also doing? It's planning more karma so that tomorrow when you watch This Is Us, you have to eat a third bag of Doritos. Does this make sense for everybody? So it's Oh, Jason, you're, this is like a great help, self-help session for me. I have a brand new Dunkin' Donuts that just opened 30 seconds from the front of my neighborhood. Dunkin' it, Donuts. Yeah, it's it's just cool. been for two weeks, and I keep dry, I have to drive by it to go anywhere. And I think cool. you go in even that first time because you go once, you're going to go every day. So now they're, I just, I just cool. need to flip that. It's a car. It's a teaching. I just need to use it. <laughs> it's not cause and effect every time I drive by. This is karma for us, right? And that's why I said before, do not let this be this esoteric Buddhist thing, right? Like where there's like a picture of a Buddha. That's, I mean, yeah, that's what this was 2,600 years ago. But right now, this is us. This is us sitting in our living rooms, watching Netflix, living modern lives. Worrying so about I said something in the Sunday teachings a couple of weeks ago. It was just something really simple. And I grew, made a jot in my note, but it, when Diane translated, it was something like really deeply, deeply examining cause and effect. And that whatever it is, if you deeply delved into the cause and you fully understand the cause, you can permanently forever end the negative consequences of, of that behavior by deeply understanding the cause and stopping the effect. And, and he made it sound so permanent, not that it was easy, but that if we really think about the causes, whether it's compulsive overeating or whether it's drinking too much or eating Doritos, whatever it is that if you really delve into the causes and you let yourself fully and explore and understand all the possible negative consequences and understand what that cause is, you can stop it. It's, it's totally possible. It, it increases that motivation and that drive to want to stop it when you see everything else that can come from it. And at you, your session today is just a great reminder of that because it, it it just felt so powerful when he said it. And I thought I've heard this a hundred times, but it's so true. I love it. Yeah, it's I, I love I love Get a lot. He's so it's so direct, right? And he says these things and, and you're like, and, and, and they can end up having a profound impact on you for the rest of your life. So thank you for kind of reiterating what he said. Yeah. Well, in your session, it's just a wonderful reminder of that exact same thing. That's just, it's so yeah. important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're all in this, right? So it's like, we're all dealing with this. We all know we are because we're, we, we're born into these human lives. By the way, I, I opened my screen back. You guys can still see the same slide, right? Yes, yeah. yeah, you can see it. It's not showing two slides, right? Just one? Just one. Okay, cool. So again, just sort of like, you know, using, using Lisa's example, you go down to Dunkin' Donuts and you get that chocolatey goodness inside of you. Get that inside me. Get that donut inside me. And then guess what? You can't have a donut without coffee. So then you got to have the donut and the coffee. And then you're like, well, now I got to watch This Is Us or that. Now I got to watch this movie because you can't have the donut and the coffee without, without the great movie. So it all, all this stuff comes together if you, if you guys sort of pay attention. And it creates this memory in the mind stream. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Buddhist teaching of karma is I don't know that they're necessarily using the word memory, but I have to use it because as Americans, we readily understand the memory. 
So you eat the chocolate. By the way, if any of you remember old Krispy Kreme donuts, I don't. They have them here, right, in Indiana. I think they do. Yeah. Krispy, Krispy Kreme. Yeah. yeah. Highly dangerous. <laughs> Flammable. You start eating Krispy Kreme, and you're going to gain three, four pan sizes. And it's like, so that that you eat that Krispy Kreme, the chocolate with the the not the not the cream, but the other stuff. You start eating that, and it's over. You're done. And it's that memory. You could, it creates that deep memory of how wonderful that chocolate was. But the thing is, is here's the problem. We don't understand. There's, we're ignorant. We don't understand that enslaving and imprisoning, and imprisoning ourselves to desires and aversions, right? I'm not going to let him talk to me that way. He's, he's overstepping my boundaries. He's not going to. She's not going to say that to me. I look what I did for her. <laughs> you got that thing and you see, and you think you're justified, right? Don't they see how much I do for them? <laughs> Here's the problem. It doesn't make us happy. It makes us miserable and it makes them miserable. Whether you're talking about the Dorito or the person that you're helping who doesn't see your help, all it does is it reinforce our selfishness. So we are, we are slaves and we are imprisoned to our, to me, to, to my, I, me. And we'll do anything to protect this, this simple thought of me, and it plays out in karma. Now, here's a real-life example of, on one hand, it's like we start joking about the Dorito. Okay, that's cool. It's funny because most of us get it. But guess what's not funny? The true data, the empirical data that you see on your screen of how much harm we cause ourselves. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the companies that sell products, whether it's food or something else, they're brilliant at evoking the emotion in us that makes us want to buy, consume, eat, drink, drive. I mean, you pick a product, they're, they're experts at making them appear as though there's something that we should invest in, right? Or we should buy. But look at this chart. You know, be, that, that 1976-1980 thing on the bottom, everything started going up. Look at the obesity rates, right? And guess what? Guess what happens with obesity, heart disease? Heart disease is like, I think it's the number one killer in the world. Heart disease, diabetes. I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of problems, metabolic syndrome. There's a whole host of physical problems that arise as the result of something that seems in it then. I just want the Dorito. It tastes good. But guess what? Look, look at this is karma. This is why nobody can really say, I don't believe in karma, right? Because karma is, remember, thought, speech, and action. You eat the Dorito. That's called contact, right? A feeling. So you got contact. Then the feeling arises. Pleasant. Then craving arises. And then grasping. I think I have that in the right order. Craving, then grasping. So this is karma. This is childhood obesity. We give our kids Doritos and cake and pie and Dunkin' Donuts, and then they get diabetes. So this is karma. This is really what we all need to understand. So let me just look at everybody again. Does that make sense? The how, how the, you know, it's like on one hand, before I showed you those graphs, you're like, oh, yeah. I get it. I want Doritos or I want my whatever my thing is. And then all of a sudden you see that graph and it's like, whoa, that's karma. That's the kids eating these foods that are bad for them, right? And then they're just instantly, they want, they want more of that pleasant taste, right? And then, it, and then it changes the karma, the seeds they're planting. It's changing how they interpret the food. They don't want broccoli. They don't want cauliflower. They don't want green stuff. They don't want fiber. They want Doritos and Coke and pie, right? Does this make sense for everybody? That's karma. Yes. And I think even my aversion to cheese Doritos is something to be looked at. Yeah. My, my aversion is, so I don't, on foods that smell strong onion, I, there are people in my home that cook, right? 
And I get mad. I'm being honest. I smell it, and I'm like, ah, I'm the one that paid for this house. Something comes <laughs> in my mind. That's what comes in my mind. I'm guilty. I, I, or, or, or another example. People cook, you know, they, they cook fish, and it's very strong smelling. It's not American. It's another country. The, the, the dish is, is a foreign dish. I smell it, and I'm like, I just instantly it evokes this deep aversion. And then guess what that turns into? Turns into this kind of hatred in the back of my mind, right? So whatever it is, you guys, we all have these, right? We all have these things that we really want and these things that we really don't want. And we think that that's okay. Anybody here think that those things help us? And, and I, I'm not trying to lead the witness, but I'm just saying, I, I, be honest. Anybody think those things help us? What things? Those things that we really want and those things that we really don't want. Oh, right. Now, for me, I've been practicing and studying for a long time, so I already know the implications of these things. So when I first found the Dharma, I was like, this, this seven-point mind training was one of the first things I started studying. And I was like, oh, my God, finally. This is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard of. And I was thinking, like, what was I 30? I think I was 34 when I found the Dharma. And I thought, and I said, oh, my God, this is the best thing I've ever seen. This, is, this, is, this will solve everything if somebody practices this. And then I started really meditating every day. I would meditate for two hours a day, at one, in, one hour in the morning, one hour at night, and I was reading, and I was applying. Sometimes I was meditating on the breath. Sometimes I was doing analytical meditation on the things that are taught. And guess what happens? You think I became more peaceful that, that the subsequent 12 months? <laughs> I became a ferocious jerk. I became, I instantly became worse. Now, and during that time, I was so confused. Why am I becoming more of a jerk? What was happening for me was I hadn't yet met Geshe Lai. I hadn't really learned what these teachings actually mean. And I was thinking that knowing the knowledge of the Dharma was going to fix me. But see, knowing the knowledge of the Dharma is just, memorization. Memorization will not fix your addiction to Doritos, Netflix, Coca-Cola, sex, internet porn, drugs, heroin, alcohol. And by the way, that's a very short list and it can be way longer. We all know it. We all experience it. Knowing doesn't really fix you, right? It's, it's the, you hit it on the head, Lisa. We have to deeply analyze so for me, just using my example, if I have this strong aversion to certain smells that come up in my house, they show up like criminals. The smell does. <laughs> so I have this aversion, right? And, and I think I'm justified. I mean, I really, the, the thought that comes up for me is I own this house. I'm the one working. And then I still have to put up with this. So now the thing is, is that I, if I sat down and deeply analyzed that, you know what I... My epiphany would be totally clear. My epiphany would be, this is completely, I am completely imprisoned and this benefits nobody. It harms me. It harms the other people because I make comments, right? That, I think that's what happens if we, if we have the courage to analyze these things. I just wanted to share one brief story, if that's okay. Please. I went to, I traveled to India in 2017 to do teachings, call it, to take the, call it chakra initiation for the second time and to, to do teachings with the Dalai Lama. And when I was, when I left, I told myself that I was thinking, you know, there's not, I had this giant addiction to Mount, Diet Mountain Dew, like 20 years running, giant addiction to Diet Mountain Dew. Like I, I'm ashamed to say it, but like a two liter every day. And it was awful. It was so bad. And Every day for years, I made excuses for, oh, it's not that bad. It's diet. It's, I mean, it's, oh, you know, I'm getting more, I'm more productive at work. I'm spending, I'm more alert with my kids, all this stuff. Totally excuses, even though I knew it was bad. 
So I go to India and there is no Diet Mountain Dew anywhere in, in my rates that I could have access. There was probably Coke or something that I could have bought, but I was a hardcore Diet Mountain Dew addict. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to replace this addiction with something else that's equally bad. So I decided that part of my spiritual journey was to just let that go, let that negative monkey on my back go. And that I was reminded of how all my excuses about how unharmful it was and it was okay, they really hit home because the first two days in India, not only just the adjustment to a new culture, but I was having massive withdrawal from caffeine headaches. No, no, I was so wretchedly sick. And a lot of it was from, some was from the travel, but a lot was from the cold turkey withdrawal from Mount Dew. And so I was there for three weeks, not a single Mountain Dew, only lots of water, lots of tea and, and herbal tea. A lot of the time, mostly water. I come back to the United States for a good year after I returned to the States. Those cravings, every time I would be in the store and would see Mountain Dew or would be at Speedway or somewhere where I could get it, even though I'd been cold turkey for three weeks and I knew I was already starting to feel better without it. Every time I had that first step, every time I came in contact with the Mountain Dew, I still had that feeling arise of, oh, wasn't that great to feel that instant perk up and that instant thing. And then immediately, like the feeling would arise without me even thinking of it. And it would immediately shift into that craving for it. Even though I remembered how awful I felt when I came off of it and had to go through the withdrawal of it. But the, the interesting thing was I realized having had three weeks without it, that I could interrupt the cycle at that grasping stage. I felt the need to grasp for it. I felt how readily available it was, how easy it would be to, to grab it and start again. But I also knew how powerful the hold it had on me. And that if I let it go to step four, I was feeling the craving without even wanting to. But if I actually got it and engaged in it, it would, it would deepen that, that positive feeling and it would, that artificial positive feeling, and it would deepen that sense of craving that I need this to get through my day. It took about 18 months for me to get to the point where on a daily basis, I was not some time in the day having that thought pop in my head of, oh, if I had a mountain dip, that would just burn me up right now. I mean, it was a long cycle, but that, as I was thinking about like, what have I had in my life that just those little things like Doritos or Mountain Dew or donuts or Netflix, whatever. Yes. When you start to examine them, they have such a tighter hold on you than you even realize they do. And it takes work and consistent practice to loosen that bond, to loosen that connection. Like you said, when you just said a minute ago, that you can't just think about it. It can't just, I mean, it can't be just, oh, Doritos are bad. I'm not going to have Doritos. You have to really see that process happening, see the feeling it's stirring up, yeah. see how you're, you want it so bad. You would sell a child for it. Like, you just like, want it. <laughs> not that it was in my case, but still. Um, yeah, you're you so know, right. You have, to, you have to recognize those patterns. And I, and before Buddhism, I just didn't, I didn't break it down like that. I didn't see those steps every single time unfolding in that same way, every time I came yeah. in contact. So. But I guess the good news is the thing I wanted to share is like, if you consistently, consistently fight that, at least at the craving point, if you can't disrupt it before then, I mean, some people can disrupt contact alcoholics. A lot of the time we'll just say, I'm not going to have alcohol in my house at all. I'm not going to go to any, my dad was an alcoholic and sometimes too. To get through that cycle, it has to be nowhere present for you to have contact with it in your world. And you still may see it on commercials or see. Yeah. You know, it may show up, but sometimes we can't, we can't not have contact with certain things yep. or they're going to come up unbidden. And so we have to get past that point of, even if you have contact with something unintentionally, can you disrupt the cycle at the other points? So anyway, that's, that's my, it's cause that was just a ridiculous scenario for me and I couldn't believe how long it lasted. But, I'm, I'm so glad you shared it because everyone on this call has a Diet Mountain Dew story. Every one of us. Some, of us, some of us don't want to share. But <laughs> we all get it. Every one of us. Yeah, everyone gets it. I mean, and it's and for that reason, it's not really, it's not really embarrassing because it's it's part of the human journey. Being hung up is just part of our human journey. That's all it is is we go around and we just get hung up on this and that. That's kind of what our life is. And 
once we find the Dharma, we, we you are sort of at some point you come face to face with this question of, do I want to change? I mean, that's really kind of the question is like, do do I really believe in this stuff that I'm that I'm studying, and am I am I ready to let go? Because at the end of the day, it's one thing to to, to read something that some brilliant guy 2,600 years ago wrote, you know, and, and, and taught. It's one thing to read and say, okay, I'm going to put this on my coffee table. It's a, mm-hmm. entirely another thing to say, I'm willing to have the courage to give up whatever it is that, that I'm kind of hooked on and attached to. And by the way, it can be people. There's another one. A lot of us are, you know, have a lot of attachment to people. And in no way, shape, or form am I saying that we should not love our husbands and wives or brothers and sisters, girlfriends and boyfriends and children. I'm not saying we shouldn't love them. But guess what? Every one of us is, at some point, everything that comes together will separate. Okay? And so that's suffering. That's when, when that person that you're really getting your enjoyment out of, first of all, they're a product. And most of us don't realize that. That person that you're that you're trying to extract all this joy from, they're our product. We don't really want to admit that, but they're a product for us. So that's the first thing. And then, and then the second thing is, can can you love somebody, which means wish for their happiness without being so attached, without the possessiveness, without the that's my, you know, put put whatever you want into the quotes. That's my friend. That's my best friend. That's my girlfriend or boyfriend, that's my husband or wife, that's my kid. You know, can you, can you love somebody, which means you want their happiness independent of what they do for you. And that's not, that's easy to say, but it's not easy to do. It takes a lot of work to do that. So any, any other, I think there's a good pause point for a, for a restroom break before, before we go. Any questions? Is there any part of the karma discussion so far that doesn't, maybe it lacks clarity for anybody? So I don't know about clarity. I feel like every time I hear about karma, the focus is on the negative things. You know, I I don't know. I mean, there's got to be the the positive side to it, right? Like, you know, building positive habits, building positive thoughts and whatnot. And I just... Yeah. It feels like every time I hear about karma, it's that kind of karma's a bitch attitude about it. You know what I mean? And yeah. It, oh, I just, I don't feel like we hear about the positive side of karma enough. Yeah. I'm really glad you said that. I'll give you a quick sneak peek. Oh, where's my, and yeah, where's my thing go? Oh, here it's like, I was you... concerned about the idea of moderation in play with all this thing, these things, um, you know, I mean, I personally know that there's habits that I've broken that I abstain from altogether because I know that there's absolutely no good, but like, you know, the idea of like for, for to play off of the freedom, if someone can, can, it does have the ability and the discipline to exercise, exercise moderation in that, you know, what does that look like in the idea of karma? Yeah. I'm so glad you, you asked the question. So. Did you guys just see a silver bullet on the screen? Let me show you the silver bullet. All right. So, okay. So this, I'll, I'll cover this one thing before we take a quick uh, break. So Andrew, I'm so glad you said it and you're totally right that the, a lot of, a lot of the karmic teachings are, Hey, what's wrong, right? Here's the thing that once you understand what causes negative karma, then you can reverse engineer what, what doesn't cause it. And that's the cause of true happiness because the Buddha taught a million and one ways that the absence of the cause of suffering is itself contentment and happiness, right? So in other words, if you stop thought, speech, and action that that is negative karma, if you stop doing that, then happiness naturally arises. So the silver bullet, Andrew, to answer your question, which, which was a great one, is love and compassion. And and, and emptiness is something we will study in this class. But for the for the time being, love is just simply the wish for others to be happy. If you have love, 
that will decimate all negative karma. But again, it's one thing to talk about it and it's, it's one thing to just understand it, but to make it, to let it seep into your heart and make every, so we get to a point where every action we do throughout the day is we try to use pure motivation, which is love for all sentient beings. So that is the start of the conversation about, about how we create positive karma. It's, it's love and compassion. Love is the wish for others to be happy. Compassion is the wish for others not to suffer. So if we, when we do things out of love, again, the American version of love is, I love you. You belong to me. You're here to make me happy. You're my object. You're my product. Like the car. I like this car. I like to drive around. I mean, we kind of treat each other like, like cars. I hate to say it, but it's to a degree. There's a, there's a variability of this, but that's how we treat each other. What can you do for me? And if it's not that, then it's a tit for tat thing. We're a very transactional society. We keep track, right? Your friend, I bought lunch the last six times. Every time the bill comes, what does old Johnny get? Johnny gets crocodile arms. He can't reach his wallet. What's up with those crocodile arms, John? You can't reach your wallet when the bill comes? Any, anybody ever have a friend like that? You always buy lunch and then, and they make twice as much as you and they never buy lunch? Old Johnny. Sorry, I got off track. Does everybody understand the love and compassion? I'll go further into it after the break, but love and compassion is the silver bullet. It is literally the end all be all. If we do everything with love and compassion, we, we can't suffer. We literally cannot suffer. But it's, it's really easy to talk about this, to say the word love. It takes like one second. And it takes next to no effort, but transforming the utter selfishness that is imbued into our minds is a lifelong path. Yeah, you know, one one thing, Jason, that uh, you know that, that that I've heard that that I I find just a really simple way to look at this is the idea of two kinds of thoughts. And so, you know, any, any thought you have, you know, and it's going to be in this, this whole process of what you talked about, you know, it's like there, there's feeling tone and then there's, then there's craving and, you know, and, and you can see yourself in this process, but, it, but if, you know, if, if, you know, if you're a little bit mindful, you know, like d during your day and, and you recognize that you're sort of in this process, you can just ask this very simple question. In, in the thought process that I'm currently in, and if this plays out, is the result going to be increased happiness and less suffering for me and for everybody else? It's going to be, you know, more happiness and less suffering, or is it going to be the other thing? It's going to be less happy, happiness and more suffering. And, and you just ask that very simple thought about, you know, if this thought plays out and, and you feed the ones that are going to create happiness and, and you know, and, you know, at the beginning, well, you even have to just recognize the ones that are going to create less happiness and you, you can sort of start to pick and choose which ones you want. Yeah. And then to add to what you're saying, Doug, there's a question of timing, right? Because if I say, I really want these Doritos, is it going to bring happiness? You're damn right. It is for <laughs> about how long? Can't bring happiness. Let's just here's the utter the utter insanity of us, right? Is I showed you the diabetic and or I'm sorry, the obesity slides, right? Obesity is killing us. We heart disease is the leading killer. Diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, all this. I mean, there's a whole list of these things. How long do you enjoy that food? It's what you know, you chew the Dorito. You take a Dorito, you put it in your mouth and you chew it. How long does that, how long does that happiness last? Like three seconds? So then you start to think about, okay, well, that, sure, Jason, but pizza is different. Because the pizza will last for a good 20 minutes if I have four or five slices. How long does that happiness last? If you, like, like you're saying, Doug, I love what you're saying. You take it and you ask the question, if I play this out, will it bring happiness? So yes. If you eat a pizza, you'll be happy for about 20 minutes. 
and then you'll feel like crap for about three hours while while your body digests what is equivalent to a cannonball in through your gut, right? So so it's it's the thing of is the short term because because most of these things that we do we do get a short term burst, right? I mean we have to admit that. Is the short term burst is does does it give us freedom? It's funny. It's for for me. What did Gazelle said? He said one time. He said, "Your happiness from food. How far does it go?" You know, and he he speaks in broken thing, broken English, and he tells you he speaks in broken broken English. I'm not saying that about him. He says it about him. He said, "You like my broken English?" So his thing one time, I remember him talking about food, and he was laughing. How 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 long does the how far is the enjoyment from here to here? No, from here to here, this much enjoyment has us all, has the whole country with diabetes, heart disease, obesity, high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome. And by the way, I could keep going. If I was knew what I was talking about, I could keep going, but I don't. So the point is, from here to here is, is dictating our life. Take that one step further, and then I, I do want to give us a break. Take that one step further for a moment. What is it that enjoys the object. You could tell me it's the it's the body, it's the tongue that enjoys the Dorito, but if you give a Dorito to a corpse, what happens? Corpse can't eat a Dorito, right? Has anybody ever given a Dorito to a corpse? At the anybody ever been to a funeral and said, Here, Johnny, eat this? No, of course not, right? You'd be crazy. A corpse can't eat a Dorito, but why is that? Because it's the mind, right? It's the mind that actually enjoys the Dorito. But what is the mind? If, if, if a corpse can't enjoy a Dorito, you have to ask the question, really ask this question. The mind is, and we'll get into this when we get to point two, the mind is basically like the sky. Our mind is like the space. Look around the room you're in right now. The space between where you are in the ceiling or the space, the space in the room that doesn't have anything, that's basically what our mind is. Our mind is like space. It's like space that's capable of knowing so how is it that empty space can like a Dorito? It's a, very, it's a very discombobulating question. And if you really investigate it, you're going to say, wait, what? Because think about it. What is the mind? You can't say the mind is the brain. You can't tell me the brain enjoys the Dorito, right? You can't tell me it's the body because you can't, because if I give a Dorito to a corpse, the corpse won't eat it. He just won't even take action. That's the body. If you tell me the body is the one that enjoys the Dorito, I'll put the Dorito on the corpse's tongue and say, Johnny, eat the Dorito. Johnny can't eat the Dorito. So it's not the tongue that enjoys the Dorito. It's something else. It's the thing that allows you right now to see me and hear me. It's awareness, right? Awareness is basically like the sky. It's like, the, it's like space. So how is it that awareness can be addicted to Diet Mountain Dew or Doritos or vegan cheese puffs? or drugs, or alcohol, or porn, or Netflix, or their best friend? How is it that something that has no material can be addicted to a material thing? I have to take a little bit of issue with that one, because you're talking about a corpse, you're talking about a, a dead body, whereas the living body actually does do things with that Dorito. Like, I mean, it, it does release chemicals and stuff, and, you know, it's like, and this is kind of what I was getting at with like moderation is, is you know, uh, the best example. The other day I was out prospecting, I was hungry. I had a Twix and, you know, I, it's not like I'm going mowing down on Twixes, but that did give me a little bit of energy to keep my mind right and keep going for the rest of the day until I was, you know, and yeah, there were healthier choices that I could make. So, I, I mean, I, I, I guess what I, like I said, I'm just kind of wondering where, the idea of moderation maybe plays into the the ideas of karma because I mean the Dorito will do something for the living body, and, and I get which like yeah it's a Dorito is not the healthiest and it's probably going to cause more work to process that Dorito than what you get out of it, but like and, you know there there's times where it actually does do something for the living body as opposed to a corpse which is a dead body. I mean. So here's the thing, right? This is not about the Dorito. 
this is not about the Twix. It's not about the alcohol. It's not about the Netflix. It's not about the Mountain Dew. This is about the mind because, see, the mind is what gets attached. We all have to eat, right? So I'm not saying you can't have Doritos. Buddhism is not about, like, you shall do this. You shall show up and do this. And if you're not, you're not a good Buddhist. Like, that's not our thing. Like, our thing is the opposite of that. Our thing is, here is the knowledge, right? Don't take my word for it. And, I, and by the way, you're doing the right thing. You're, you're asking questions. You're saying, I don't know if I buy into this. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. And that's what we want. We want people that look at it and say, wait, is it that way? So the thing, but just to clarify, though, the Twix is not the problem. And tw the Twix is not fundamentally bad. It's <clears throat> once you taste the Twix, make a, com make a comparison for a second. You ever eat raw almonds, right? So you got raw almonds, and when I say raw, I mean non, non-smoked, non-salted. Very boring, right? You got raw almonds, and then you got a Twix. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on anybody for eating a Twix. I'm just making an example. You eat a raw almond, and it's like, you know that feeling that arises? So you have contact, then a feeling arises. When you eat an almond, there's not, it's not that pleasant. It's kind of like neutral, isn't it? Or if you don't have water, it's a little bit. It's not really very good because it's yes. very dry. Yeah. So the uh, almond, when you when you consume the almond, it's it's there's not really a lot of craving that's inherently going to arise. But when you assume the, when you consume the Twix, these companies are brilliant. So they create these things that hook us, and that's why those charts that I showed you, Americans are dying and they're so sick because they're addicted to these things. So it's, it's about the mind. It's about what happens to the mind. If you can eat 10 Twixes a day and be cool, you can do that. If you can't, you can't. But it's about learning the way that the mind works when it's going through all these experiences. I got you. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I mean, I've heard you speak on that before. I've heard Mark, you know, I, and is it Andy that does the... Be beginning yeah. Buddhism, yeah. yeah. I've heard, uh, I mean, I've heard all three of you kind of touch on that before. I guess that's kind of what I was getting at. It's like I feel like a lot of times when the issue, when the topic of karma comes up, it it, it can sound so extreme, and and I just like it, it it can get really focused on the negative side of things, and I just I was I, like you know my first. Uh, my my first beginning Buddhism, Mark was talking about renunciation while eating a thing of like SpaghettiOs or something. And he was joking about that. Like, it doesn't mean that you can't just not eat anything that you enjoy, yeah. but you, like you were saying, it's the mental part of it that we have to be aware of. I guess I was just kind of trying to get at that is, you know, it's not necessarily like a total abstinence from everything we enjoy. Yeah. And, and by the way, there's a reason that it sounds extreme. It sounds extreme because we live in a country where we're eating ourselves to death. We live in a country, see, this is, so the Buddhists call human existence the desire realm, which means that we just run around chasing our desires, right? So the reason that this might sound extreme is because we've been conditioned in a capitalistic society where we've literally been taught you can go out and buy your happiness. You can go out and eat your happiness. I mean, that's, what, that's how we've been conditioned. So the idea that every, every thought, speech, and action creates a seed, it, let's be honest, it's a little bit of a foreign idea for most of us. But it doesn't mean nobody is telling anybody what to do around here. Most of us are going to go and do what we do. The key is mindfulness. So the key is you're meditating every morning, Andrew. The thing is, when we meditate and we watch the breath, we're trying to develop mindfulness like what Doug said a moment ago. That mindfulness is you're supposed to see, learn how to see, oh, I'm eating this, and it's, this is the thing that's coming up, and then this is, then I'm craving it. That's what we're, we're trying to learn. Yeah. So it's not the object that you're eating or the thing you're consuming. It's the, it's the mental karma that's arising. That's what we have to learn how to see. So the difference in your example between eating a, a Twix or Doritos or whatever it is and eating, eating almonds, as he was saying, it, uh, 
the example of I, I'm hungry. I'm genuinely hungry. I would like, I, my body's telling me I need something to get me through the rest of the afternoon. That's not positive or negative. That's just neutral. That's just, I'm, I'm yeah. putting myself in contact with food because I'm hungry. I feel like my body's giving me signals that I need something to eat right now. But for me, it would be that point where if I have the Twix bar and if I have the almonds and the almonds don't sound appealing to me, but the Twix bar does, or if I only have the almonds, but I keep thinking about the Twix bar and I'm dissatisfied and disgruntled and unhappy, even though the almonds will meet my nutritional needs and will stop me from being hungry. It's that extra craving, that extra kick I know I might get from the Twix bar, even if it's mental. It's that deep preference for that one thing and nothing else is good enough in this moment. It has to be this, that, yeah. that at least for me causes that step into grasping. And that preference came because we ate almonds once we ate a Twix mm -hmm. once the Twix was a million times better than the almonds. The almonds are right. the most boring the thing you've ever eaten. Yes. So we, then we got, then we grasped it and we craved it. And then we, and then once you eat that, Right before you put it in your mouth, your dopamine's like, oh, yes, I'm about to eat, to eat the Twix or the Doritos or whatever. So it's about, it's about understanding what, how this all fits, how it works. And your question, just real quick before we go on break, moderation. <laughs> moderation, it has the ability to arise if and when we understand karma. If you understand karma, you're going to be more inclined to want to moderate. If you understand that every time... I eat a whole bag of vegan cheese puffs. It creates my, it makes me more addicted to it. You're going to want to say, hmm, what if I try having one? What will happen? If the enjoyment is coming from the flavor, will one suffice? <laughs> then you might test it. And then you might get to the point where you can actually have one. So that moderation can become very stable if you have a deep understanding of karma. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Ten minute break, and then we can come back and meditate together. Does that sound good for everybody? Hey, could I just give a real quick, please, please, yeah, real, real quick announcement? So for for anybody who's planning to join Geshe's teaching tomorrow, which usually starts at three fifteen, it's going to start at four, okay. and be, because uh, Tashi is going to be translating, we're going to take a break from chapter nine, and Geshe is going to teach um, how to take the Bodhisattva vows. Uh -huh. Cool. Tomorrow afternoon. That's great. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. All right, cool. So uh, 10 minutes. Is that cool for everybody? And obviously, if anybody has other questions, you can, I'll stay back for a sec. Okay, because I have a question. But yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Everyone. No, uh, no, please. So say, like, for example, I have an aversion towards a certain person. And I recognize that. And when I see that person, I immediately think, like, I can't stand this person. They get on my nerves. And I recognize that. But then I try to combat that with, like, oh, maybe they're not, like, trying to think good thoughts about that person instead of, okay, so the karmic seed from the negative thoughts, is that, like, permanently there? Or by me practicing, like, thinking good thoughts about them instead? Will that like erase that karmic seed, if that makes any sense? I don't know, like if I'm wording that correctly. Yeah, you're, you're definitely wording it correctly. And, and I'm so happy. See, this is what I want. I want us to, I want each of us to look at our life and say, this, these are the teachings that are coming from the Buddha, right? The Dharma, they're, te they're giving us these teachings. And then how do I actually use this stuff? So I'm so happy that you asked the question. So when you, you're, you are already recognizing the negative thoughts, right? You're already, you're already seeing it. And now, just a little trick. When those thoughts come, if you can, pay attention to your body. Because some people will make your body feel kind of like, uh, the, some people will make your body feel peaceful. Some people will make, make your body feel like, oh, I want that person. Some people will make your body feel like, oh, I hate that guy. So, so if you can pay attention to your, your heart and your physical body, you might know, you might learn something because, and, and it become, it can become an early warning system of, oh, I'm, I might say something I regret because this person's making me feel a certain way. And I know that because of the feeling in my chest or whatever, but having, having said that, 
that was just an aside note for you. Absolutely. Once karma is planted, then, it, the, okay, if you plant a peach tree, it will grow, right? But we have a belief in Buddhism, which is that you can purify karma. Now, purification is what Lojong's about. Lojong is thought transformation or thought purification. So the reason that you dislike that person and I dislike the smells that come from certain food is because we experienced it once, we didn't like the feeling, and then we started to develop this thing and we kept repetitively having that thought and that feeling. I see that person, I don't like him. He said this, I don't like him. So over and over we create this and then we plant this idea and it's like the minute you see him, you already, him or her, you already don't like him, right? So we have to purify that. We have to purify that habit. And there's a, there's a bunch of stuff we'll do later in this course. One of them is the Dalai Lama says something that's so beautiful all the time. He says, we're all the same. We all want happiness and we don't want suffering. So you, most of us don't know anybody that wants suffering and dislikes happiness. So our fundamental, we look different and we say different words, but fundamentally, we're pretty much the same. We all want happiness and we don't want to suffer. So if you can try to keep that in mind it, now, and then if somebody's doing something, here's one more thing. If somebody's hurting you, if somebody hurts somebody, Buddhism is not saying stay there and take it and let like stay there and be a punching bag like that. It's not that it's more about what is your attitude because your inner attitude is going to have an implication of you. Right? So if you, if you keep developing hate, hate and anger actually lead to heart attacks. I believe that. Yeah. So, so again, I kind of gave you a long answer, but absolutely it's, it does, won't last forever. You have the ability to purify it okay. and, Love will purify it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So when you see, when we see that person, the, the, the aversion is going to arise. The, oh God, I wish I didn't have to deal with this person. Try to immediately see that and just say, I really hope that they're happy. May you be happy. May you have happiness and the causes of happiness. And if you. you just, yeah. And if you just, What's the old thing? Fake it till you make it. Yeah. Sometimes going through the act, uh, the uh, the steps, you know, like going through the action. Eventually, you'll actually start to believe it. So that's another, like, you know, just may you be happy. May you be happy, kind of like that. But there'll be you'll have some really good antidotes in the in the upcoming classes about how to deal with that, like difficult people and stuff like that. Okay. One of the best ones is nice people who give us all kinds of compliments. How, how much growth can we have from a person who's constantly saying, oh, you're so good at that, Jason. Oh, you're so great. How, how much can we grow from those kind of people? Not very much. <laughs> right. Like, because if somebody's constantly telling me I'm great, then there's no, there's no opportunity for me to develop patience. But when somebody's really difficult, in Tibetan Buddhism, we actually believe that person's a teacher because they're teaching us in a very direct way about our negative, our negative emotional feelings like anger, you know, jealousy, stuff like that. Like that's, it's not easy to deal with people like that, but they can help us be really, really patient. And if we believe that, if we understand if, if I can just be more patient, that person can't even affect me. Right. So then if you look at this and you're like, oh man, I used to think this person, I wanted to run, but now when I see him, it is, if, if, if I can be patient with this guy, I can do anything in my life. There's literally no boundary. So they're, they're kind of like a teacher. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say it's kind of similar, like the tough times really are what challenges your character and makes you absolutely yeah yeah it grows it grow, it builds character that's the old saying in america right yeah yeah hey jason yeah out of like 
dealing with someone who may be difficult and like, I kind of, I get what you, you what you're saying on that, on, on that, but I guess what I'm kind of wondering about is like, at what point would Buddhism view somebody in this? Maybe there may be no point. There may be a totally different way of thinking about this, but like, as far as somebody who, who could be toxic as opposed to just difficult. Well, hey, the, yeah, it's, it's a very good question, right? At the end of the day, what's a good example? Okay. The toxicity, where is the toxicity in that person? That's the question. I mean, you know, I guess like to me, I don't know what I, to me you have, like, I, I guess what I'm looking at is someone who's difficult is maybe someone who you have a boss that's really hard to work with or something like that. And yeah, I, I can see where you can learn from that. But like, if you have someone who I, I get, so to be, I, I give you a direct, uh, what I'm going, going with right now is I have a friend who is, you know, an addict to opiates and just pretty much just ger generally treats people poorly. And, and I struggle with how to deal with that situation because there's a point where I put myself out there Yeah, that it, and, and it becomes negative and and I know that part of that's, again, my conditioning of ways to deal with things and whatnot. And I guess I'm kind of looking for a different viewpoint or a different outlook, a different way of dealing or thinking with about things that, that could maybe, you know, at what point do, cause I'm at a point with this particular individual where I, I'm just, it's cut off because I just can't deal with it in the way it affects me. And yeah. So, so okay. When, when we're dealing with anybody, and an addict is a very good example, when we're dealing with anybody, there's only one thing that we have any modicum of control over, and even that is somewhat laughable. That one thing is our own mind. And that's even laughable because we're, we're habitually conditioned with all this karma from our past, right? So it's yeah. like you can try to control your mind. You definitely can't control somebody else. It's especially not an addict because they're immune to logic. They only want one thing and they're physically opiates are so horrible. So here's the thing, right? You can, no matter what they do, you can cultivate love in your mind. What I would do if I were you is I would make sure that you're not, you're not perpetuating their addiction in any way. So that means don't enable them. Do not be giving them money and, and oh, you're going to use it for food? You promise? Nope. I'll buy you a meal, right? So I think that's something is don't allow yourself to harm them. And then m more importantly than anything for you is cultivating love and cultivating compassion. Think for a moment about how horrible, imagine if you were an opiate addict and you, if you didn't consume that drug, you would vomit and you would though and you would you would have your body would profusely sweat you would sweat through all your shirts like as though you ran 20 miles and you would be nauseous and you would be dizzy and and it, it would last for five days think about that imagine yourself as that person right like really try to sit there for later on take five or ten minutes and imagine, visualize yourself as that person. And all of those, visualize the thickness, visualize all the people that you've pushed away, how you've broken everybody's hearts, how nobody trusts you anymore, nobody believes you. Like if you try to go through that, all of that, your mind will change from like irritation and anger to compassion. But I'm not telling you that you should stick around and watch the show. Yeah, that is 
So there's there are two different things. There's what are you going to do, and then there's what's your, what's inside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you can you can have something beautiful inside you, pure love for this person, and you could make the decision. I really I really care about you, but for the moment, I'm going to create a little bit of space between us. Yeah. And I mean. And don't be like, oh, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I've, I've, it's just a really difficult thing. And I, I guess it's something that like, it, I, I've grown up with them. So yeah, it's something I really struggle in maintaining a positive attitude and compassion and love for, because I mean, I, he's like my brother, I do love him, but it, 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 so I, it's not really a, I, I totally hear what you're saying and, and I have practice some of these th things to some degree and they do work and it's just it's just one of those things that can be really frustrating and irritating because it just doesn't the cycle doesn't seem to break and it's like I, I have actually dealt with some of these things and gotten past it myself and yeah. I can and I can struggle with being more frustrated because of that because then I get to I guess toot my own horn to some extent like I did it why can't you you know, and, and yeah, and it's just, it, it, and it's a vicious cycle that is hard to break and, and what it does. And I don't know, it's probably, I shouldn't look at it as what it does to me. Maybe that's part of what needs to change, but it's just, it's a very difficult situation. My whole family is addicts and alcoholics, so I know exactly what you're talking about it's really difficult to to deal with but i had an experience with i'll just kind of put it out there i had an experience with my dad he was a alcoholic drug addict for a long time and when i was in my early 20s i was like why can't i get this guy to fly straight like w w i'm not man enough to get him to listen to me i really believed that <laughs> I, I, I and I mean, I've kind of gotten past that phase of things, but I absolutely know what you're talking about, where I took the tail top of his failure on myself. It's yeah. Yeah. I, I dealt with that for a long time. And then it, what it turned into for me was anger. I was, I just kind of, I became very, I'll be honest, I became very hateful, very spiteful, very negative. And I don't know why, but at some point something clicked for me and this was before Buddhism, but something clicked for me and I, Somehow it, I converted it into love and acceptance, but guess what? I, I still kind of broke ties because even though I, I, I forgave him, I literally forgave him, but then I broke ties for, for a time because I came to the conclusion that he's the only one that can make the decision to change, but, but I maintained love. So you can maintain love independent of what somebody's doing. Yeah. And I guess this kind of comes back full circle to what you're saying of it being, of them being a teacher. I mean, is because I feel like I'm at a point where I, I go back and forth between the, that love and compassion and that anger that you're talking about. And because our relationship is so deep rooted, it's really hard for me to maintain that love and compassion. I start there and then it just ends up coming back to the, you know what I mean? And it's just, I do. It's I'm dealing with and it kind of like I said it, it clearly it comes full circle back to what you were saying of them being a teacher and but I I appreciate what you're saying is like like I guess I sometimes I feel really guilty about cutting ties or distancing myself and not being in there dealing with it and, and that's that can be tough for me so yeah I don't you know there's no textbook answer as we know right we're very, humans are complicated and people who are addicts have a lot of, there's complicated issues. Bottom line is just keep coming back to love and compassion. And then I guarantee you that whole thing will, the whole thing will take care of itself because as long as you're okay, because the problem for you exists only in your heart and mind, it's nowhere else, right? So as long, if you deal with that, then your actions will be right no matter what. So. Right on. Awesome. So maybe we, yeah, no, thank you for, yeah, for, for talking it out. I think this is, let us all help each other through this stuff. So I would like to propose that today we can meditate on 
the so we we already did precious human life and then we did impermanence and death last time i would like to propose that we do a meditation today on impermanence because actually just to sort of if i may to steal from andrew's situation every time that we deal with somebody difficult like like if it's a drug addict or if it's a a boss or whoever when we deal with somebody difficult it seems like it feels like that is going to last forever it feels like the anger or the frustration or the sadness that we're feeling is going to last forever it really seems that way but it's more like little kids in in the back seat of a car saying dad when are we going to get there that's what it's actually like is that things you're going to arrive at some point at the destination dad are we there yet Shut up, son, right? But you're going to, eventually you'll get there and be like, oh, I remember when we were six hours away, it seemed like we'd never arrived. We've all been through that as kids, right? Plane ride, car ride. So that is what life is like, but we don't see it. Life is impermanent. Everything that comes, no matter how difficult it is, it will eventually dissolve. So let's do a meditation on that. And we can start by just closing our eyes and, you know, just sitting up straight and just touch in on your body for a moment. Feel your body, feel your butt on the seat. And forget about the past. Forget about the future. Just completely let go of the past, completely let go of the future. And just be here in this moment right now. One of the best ways to get into this moment is just focus on your body. Keep the attention in your body. That's the only rule. You can scan your body, but just keep your attention in your body for a few minutes. You might notice your body's a little tense. Completely let go of all the tension. Let it melt down into the earth. Now bring your attention to the tip of your nostrils. Pay attention to the breath, inhaling and exhaling, and the sensation at the tip of your nostrils. Distracting thoughts are fine whenever you catch yourself distracted. Be really happy that you were mindful enough to catch the distraction and then just go back to the nose. On the out breath, intentionally let go of all the tension in your body.
Now for the duration of the 11 minutes of meditation, keep your attention on the breath at the nostrils and contemplate the constant change that occurs as you breathe. When any thought comes up and distracts you, simply contemplate its impermanence. Any sound that comes up, you can pay attention to the sound and see it's impermanent. Everything that comes into your senses, just contemplate its impermanence, but try to stay with the breath and contemplate its impermanence as you breathe.
as we focus on the breath coming in and out of the nostrils. Situations from your life will appear in your mind. Thoughts will arise. Situations will arise. Try to contemplate. If I let go of this, can I see the impermanence of the situation dissolving in my own mind? All thoughts, emotions, feelings are impermanent. So as you're watching the breath and thoughts and emotions arise during the meditation, watch them come, watch them be, and then watch them go. Okay, opening our eyes, coming back to reality. Maybe smile a little bit. Smile at the joy that we all just experienced. Any, I had a bit of an aha moment. You know, impermanence is strange because it's so powerful. It seems simple, but it's really powerful. My epiphany was anything that we experience is only temporary. It's going to dissolve at some point if you just leave it alone. And so that's one of the ways you guys can use impermanence is as you experience life and situations arise, whether it's good or bad, just try to see that it's a temporary appearance and it's only a matter of time before it dissolved on its own. Does that make sense? In fact, any hangups that we have are kind of like a cell phone. If you plug it in, then it's going to get charged. So that's kind of how our problems exist. We charge them up. We create them. So it's not the outside world that causes the problem. It's our mind. It's how we like some things and then we don't we don't like other things. So we're constantly plugging in the cell phone charger that is our problems. So if we just see the problems and say, this is another impermanent thing, it's going to dissolve on its own. I can I can only win, right? Does that make sense? Any questions? 
about today's teaching? I just wanted to say that sometimes things take decades for them to work out, to find healing, whatever. It's a great point. And they seem like they're going to last forever when they're working themselves out. At least for me. Yeah, thanks for that insight, Kathy. That's really helpful. Anybody else? Any comments or questions about today's session? Everybody's good? Thank you, Jason. It's really nice. Oh, Very helpful. Thank you. You guys are really wonderful. And I couldn't practice on a Saturday morning like this without you all. So it's, thank you all for, I bow to each of you for showing up. Thank you so much. I will, uh, let's do the dedication. So at the end of every positive act that we do, we dedicate it. And it's just another brilliant way to let go of the selfishness. Cause see, there is something called spiritual materialism. You start doing meditation and you start doing maybe generosity you're giving to charities and you start thinking you're great, <laughs> which is the opposite of what we're trying to do. We're trying to let go of me and think only about the love we have for others. So just make sure when, when we dedicate it, it's like, once you dedicate it, it's don't no, no longer are we going to grasp at how great we were at, by what we did. So, okay. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminished, but increased more and more. In the land encircled by snow white mountains, the source of all happiness and benefit flows in your person. Kenrazig Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. Just as the Bodhisattva Manjushri attained omniscience and Samantabhadra too, so now do I dedicate these merits to train and follow in their footsteps. As all the victorious Buddhas of the past, present, and future praise dedication as supreme, so now I too dedicate these sources of my merit for all beings to perfect good actions. Well, thank you guys. Really appreciate thank all you. of you. Thank you, Jason. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you guys. It was really wonderful. Sorry the meditation was a little short, but I guess. We were having really good conversations, so it's all good, right? Yes. Cool. Any other kind of last minute comments and questions before we roll out? I was, I appreciate you and everyone else from the, in, you know, in the Buddhist center. One of the, with the questioning and whatnot, I know like, and I don't mean to disrespect anybody else's faith, but I know like being brought up Christian, there was always idea that you don't question it and i just i really appreciate the the idea that you know we're supposed to analyze these things and question them and how open everybody is to questions and kind of and clearly not taking it as disrespect because so yeah when i heard that the buddha said do not take what i teach on blind faith i was like i'm in <laughs> the best because it's like it, 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 there was no insecurity, right? So like when you're practicing a faith that there's all this perceived insecurity, like you just do what I say. Don't ask. <laughs> it's like, what? what, am I sick? So yeah, and I'm not talking about any particular religion, by the way, because I believe that, you know, every religion is equally valuable. It's just that sometimes the people that are in those traditions have misunderstandings about the meaning. So. Yeah. yeah. Can I share? I was I was talking to Geshla a, a few weeks back, and we were talking about interaction. You know, during his teachings, you know, because he knew kind of way the Bodhisattva right now. You know, which is really difficult stuff, right? I mean, it's really esoteric and difficult to understand. You know, and 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 I shared with him conversations I had had with a lot of people who said, well, you know, he's, you know, it's like that. He's a master. He's teaching. I want to be polite. I don't want to interrupt him in the middle of it, you know, and he stopped me right there. He said, that is wrong thinking. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was direct and he's like, you tell people, you know, it's like they have, you have a question, you ask it. <laughs> this is crazy. 
like even I've probably I've heard something along those lines and everything that I've sat on and it sat in and there's still that hesitation that's like been built into me like I'm not supposed to question things so it's you know it's, it's yeah it's there it's but I it, anyway it's, it's kind of a cultural thing that we have here you know it's like we're we're, we're sort of taught you know and in in school you know we're taught you know, sit in class be quiet don't interrupt and you know all of that and he's like nope. That's not the way I want people to do it. Yeah. There's a, there's one thing that the true guru is within. So this is, this is kind of the tantric tradition, but the idea is the true guru is within meaning that the, the real, the real teacher is you. You're the one. So, so we spend this two hours together and then for the rest of your 24 hours times seven, you're alone with your own mind. So you have to question and you have to analyze because if you don't, then all of this is meaningless. Yeah. Right. Because you have to figure this out so that when you're, when you're with yourself later and your friend makes you mad, that's the moment when you have to say, okay, can I apply this stuff for each of us, for me, for all of us. Right. great well any anything else anybody cool well your homework is to stay away from dorito <laughs> <laughs> actually your homework is to see right that when we take something and it's pleasant whether it's food or tv or whatever we'll just watch just watch the mind try to be keenly aware of what happens and see if these teachings are accurate according to your experience. That's really what we all have to try to do. So, cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you all. Take care. Be safe. We'll see you guys next Sunday. I hope. I hope I see all of you next Sunday. I'll see Jason and Andrew on Monday. You guys are welcome to join us. 8 a.m. every day. The three amigos. We're we're on it every day. It's pretty awesome. Would like to be four amigos or three amigos and an amiga, or maybe three amigos and three amigas, <laughs> whatever, whatever is good. You're all welcome. So if possible, some people work and during that time, but either way, we'll see you guys soon. Take care. Have a good week. Bye. Be safe, everybody. Thank you.